Hello everybody and welcome to a very special video here on the channel. I am still away on my honeymoon, although I will be back in real time in the studio later this week to catch up on all the stuff that I've missed while we've been away. But I wanted to take this open day really while I was gone to compile something I've been doing on Charts with Dan for a few months now. You'll see the origins of this segment in the video that you're about to see, but kind of accidentally one week, I stumbled on what I thought was a really fascinating local independent theater located in the Northeast. And spilling over from that, I thought it would be fun most weeks on the show to find one of these theaters and to spotlight it on the show. A portion of the ad revenue from charts goes to these theaters if they're nonprofits that take donations. And there are so many great stories and so many cool, fun looking theaters that I found inside the United States and a few outside of the United States that when I was compiling ideas for videos I wanted to put out while I was gone, I thought it would be great to put together all of these indie cinema spotlights that I've been doing on charts so that you can see all of the different theaters I've featured over the past several months in case there were some that you didn't see or some that you wanted to see again. Plus, I'm never against giving more exposure to small businesses, usually independently run businesses, and many of them nonprofits here on the channel. So what follows is a compilation of all of the local indie cinema spotlights that I've done on charts this year. And of course, stay tuned to charts for the remainder of this year and going into 2024 because it's something that I will keep doing. And if you have a theater that has not yet been featured here on one of these videos, please send it in because I found so many of these theaters from commenters and people here on YouTube and social media saying, hey, take a look at this theater or that theater. And I've later gone on to put them on the show. So enjoy this look at the local cinema spotlights and I will be back with you here in studio later this week. Let's return to the weekend box office and look at the per theater averages for this past weekend. At number one was the Irish film The Quiet Girl, which is an Oscar nominee for Best International Film. It began its official rollout release after an Oscar qualifying run at the end of last year. Six theaters for an average of $9,858 per theater. At number two, big drop notwithstanding, was Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, bringing in $7,357 in each of its 4000 345 theaters. At number three was Claire Denis' debut film from 1988, Chocolat, which was given a 4K re-release in one theater in New York. It brought in $7,195 in that one theater. And it was not, as my initial research seemed to indicate, the screening of the 2000s Best Picture nominee, Chocolat, starring Johnny Depp and Juliette Binoche. It also played in one theater this past weekend. It was the final film in the Foodie Comfort Series at the Waldo Theater in Waldoboro, Maine. Tickets were 8 bucks for adults and $5 for kids. That's a great deal. And I'm happy to hear that they were able to do the screening because last month's screening of Julie and Julia, which was the second film in the Foodie Comfort Series, was canceled due to a snowstorm. If you happen to be passing through Waldoboro, Maine this weekend, be sure to check out the Waldo, which is a beautiful 1930s era theater recently restored and reopened. They'll be having a free, free family film showing of Steven Spielberg's The BFG this Saturday afternoon at 2. So if you find yourself in Waldeboro, Maine, check out The BFG and tell them Dan sent you. You know, this is a really interesting show because, you know, one minute you are researching the biggest weekend one to weekend two drops of all time for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the next moment you almost list a showing at an obscure theater in Maine on your per theater average chart, and then you realize that it's a different movie, but then you want to know more about that obscure theater in Maine, so then you keep looking up information about the Waldo Theater in Waldoboro, Maine, which, by the way, is run by a team of volunteers who opened this 1936, I think, movie house and renovated it and saved it from complete dilapidation and are now turning it again into a palace for showing movies, which, by the way, you're doing the work of every cinephile ever, so so thank you. I also really kind of hope beyond hope that there is one Charts with Dan viewer that actually lives in Waldoboro, Maine, because I think I just blew their mind. Anyway, shout out to the Waldo Theater in Waldoboro, Maine, because you almost got listed on Charts with Dan, because I thought that the chocolate that you showed was the chocolate that was playing in New York. Two different chocolates. Almost a big mistake, but hey, great job. Keep doing what you're doing. 
And speaking of that 4K restoration of Chocolat that was playing in one theater in New York, I actually had an almost misunderstanding last week where I thought that it was a screening of the Johnny Depp Juliet Binoche film Chocolat at a different theater. And so I was researching what theater that was. And I realized that I'd made a mistake, but I also wanted to keep researching the theater that I'd found that was playing the other Chocolat. And I talked about it on the show last week. And many of you said like, well, you know what? Maybe you should make that a regular feature on the show to find an independent theater that you think is interesting and that you want to talk about. And it's like, well, sure. I mean, why not? Why The show's long enough already. Let's tack on a few extra minutes. So I did actually find another independent theater that I want to talk about during the segment. And maybe we'll keep doing this. I don't know. This was fun for me. This week, I want to talk about a theater I found in Brookline, Massachusetts called the Coolidge Corner Theater. It is a former church that was converted into an Art Deco movie theater back in 1933 and has been open ever since. It wasn't an easy road, though. It faced some financial difficulties in the late 80s, and the building was actually sold to a developer and was scheduled for demolition. But this is so incredible. A group of citizens formed an organization to save the theater. They had it declared a city historical landmark in order to delay the demolition. They were trying to raise over $2 million to help buy out that developer. And at one point, citizens from the town literally formed a chain around the theater to show how much they wanted to protect it. And when they couldn't raise enough money to save the theater, a local realtor, this man named Harold Brown, bought the Coolidge Corner Theater and leased the theater long term to the nonprofit group that was formed from the people who had gathered to save the theater from demolition. The Coolidge Corner Theater was reestablished as a cultural center, and 10 years later, Harold Brown saved the theater again by forgiving $350,000 in back rent so that the theater could afford renovations. Look at this guy very closely. He sadly passed away a few years ago, but Harold Brown understood what this theater meant to this city. The Coolidge Corner Theater is still a fully independent theater, and this week, if you're near Brookline, Massachusetts, which is right in the Boston metro area, you can catch all of the Oscar short film nominees, as well as The Quiet Girl, which I was just talking about, and that 4K restoration of Chocolat, which led me down this crazy road to begin with. On Friday and Saturday, it is a Brendan Fraser tribute. Friday night, they're playing Airheads. Saturday night, they're playing Monkey Bone. And if you're not going to be watching the Oscars, they're playing the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. You can buy tickets for these movies online. And even if you can't go, it is a nonprofit organization. It is a nonprofit theater. You can donate at Coolidge.org slash donate. And if you send a donation or you go check a movie at the Coolidge Corner Theater, Tell them Dan sent you. I had a great time researching this story. And the idea that you had this town that rallied around this theater, that understood its importance culturally and historically, and you had a citizen like Harold Brown who saved this theater twice over uh, from demolition or from falling into disrepair. That is a love for the arts. That is a love for cinema. That is a passion. It's it's what I've given my life uh, to. It's certainly what drives uh, me to to come up with these crazy things and build franchise trackers is because I love movies. And this is a story about a love for movies. And I'm hoping someday to get to the Boston area and visit the Coolidge Corner Theater because it really does look like a palace, a movie palace, for film lovers. By the way, while we're talking about per theater averages, which are all about the single theater, I've been highlighting one independent theater on the show for the last couple weeks, and I wanted to do it again this week. I'm not going to promise to do it every week, but so many of you after last week sent me a comments of theaters that I could check out. I have probably about three dozen independent theaters on my list to investigate and put on the show, and the one that I wanted to feature this week, and thank you for sending in those suggestions, by the way, is a really beautiful beautiful looking theater called the Bird Theater in Richmond, Virginia. It was built in the 1920s and it's been operating ever since as a movie theater. In 2007, it became a nonprofit committed to the preservation of the theater itself as well as the movie going experience there. It is listed as a national historic landmark and this weekend, I mean, look at these three movies. This weekend, you can check out Shrek, you can check out Terminator 2, and you can check out Rear Window all on the big screen. Tickets are just eight bucks. Come on, you can't beat that deal. This This place looks absolutely stunning, and I really hope to see it in person someday. There aren't a whole lot of theaters left that look like this. It is a movie palace, the definition of a movie palace. You can find the theater's full schedule, information about the history of the theater, and a donation link if you just want to send them a few bucks. It is a non 
profit after all, at birdtheater.org. They spell bird, B-Y-R-D. And if you decide to send a donation or go see a movie at the Bird Theater, as always, tell them Dan sent you. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place to see a movie. I'm not really ever in Richmond, Virginia, or even in Virginia or near Virginia, but if I ever am, the Bird Theater is on my list. So thank you to everybody who sent me in theaters, and stay tuned. Maybe I will talk about the theater that you sent me, and please also keep them coming. Of course, many theaters who are playing these limited release films are independent theaters, and I've started a new feature where I like to showcase an independent theater each week, and so many of you have sent me some great suggestions of independent theaters for me to feature here on the show, and I'm super excited about this week's theater. It's called The Vogue Theater in Manistee, Michigan. It is the only movie theater in Manistee County, population 25,350. The movie theater was built in 1938, but closed down in 2005. However, it was bought out of bankruptcy by the Manistee Downtown Development Authority and sold to a newly formed nonprofit organization that had the mission of renovating and reopening the theater. Over $2 million was raised, and in late 2013, the theater reopened its doors once again with two screens for people to enjoy movies on. Those two screens are the only two that are servicing the 25,000 residents of Manistee County and the 6,300 residents of Manistee proper. This week, you can catch their weekly $2 classic, Only Angels Have Wings. They do this every single week. Every Wednesday, you can see a classic film for $2, or you can go see Shazam! Fury of the Gods and everything everywhere all at once. Peak ticket prices at the Vogue Theater, 8 bucks, and you can't beat that, except for spring break week, because starting on Friday, Vogue is doing their spring break week. Check this out for the kids that are out of school. Four movies showing every day for the week of spring break. Matilda the Musical, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, The Bad Guys, and Megan are screening free every single day. All you have to do is show up for a ticket up to 24 hours before showtime, and you can spend an entire day at the movies seeing these movies for free. The Vogue is a 501c3 nonprofit, and you can support the Vogue Theater at VogueTheaterManistee.org. And also so starting this week and then going retroactively back to the theaters that I've featured on the show so far, 10% of the ad revenue from every Charts with Dan video will also be going to these theaters, most of which are run by nonprofit organizations. So the Vogue Theater in Manistee, Michigan, go catch some free movies over the weekend or catch the Best Picture winner. Great ticket prices. And if you decide to check it out, as always, tell them Dan sent you. And that brings us to a new feature here on the show, which is that each week or most weeks, I'm going to feature an independent theater. And this week, I want to talk about the Hollywood Theater in Portland, Oregon, which is a beautiful looking theater. It was built in 1927. At one time, it was converted into a full Cinerama 70 millimeter theater. It played films like 2001, A Space Odyssey. Back in 2015, they actually brought 70 millimeter back. The theater is on the National Registry of Historic Places, but it was in danger as so many of these theaters have. Have been a falling into disrepair. It was purchased with the help and support of the public by a nonprofit in 1997. In 2017, the Hollywood Theater kind of paid it forward because there was a local Portland video store called Movie Madness that was in danger of going out of business. Through public donations, it took over that store. It now runs Movie Madness in order to keep that store's collection of movie titles, which is tens of thousands of titles, available to the community. This weekend at the Hollywood Theater in Portland, Oregon, you can catch movies like Martha Coolidge's Valley Girl. Slumber Party Massacre 2, and A Clockwork Orange, which is projecting on 35mm. And coming up next month, their lineup includes, just to name a few, the new film Air, Star Trek First Contact, which is playing on First Contact Day, RRR is still playing there at the Hollywood Theater, along with Blazing Saddles on 35mm, and so much more. You can check out the Hollywood Theater in Portland, Oregon, buy tickets, they're about 10 bucks each, or you can also donate to the Hollywood Theater at hollywoodtheater.org, and if you do make it down there, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And as I'm going to do with this theater and the other theaters that I featured here on the show, 10% of the monetization, the ad revenue from this video, will be donated to the Hollywood Theater just as a way to help support the independent film-going community because it's people like the ones that run this theater and the other ones that we've talked about here on the show that really keep not just the business of the movies but the lifeblood of movies and the cinema alive, that love and that passion. So I actually hope, looking at those pictures, to get to the Hollywood Theater one day and please go check them out because it looks like a really, really great place. 
And of course, the theaters that are often playing these movies that we're talking about, like Boa's Afraid, are the independent theaters around this great country of ours. And as I've been doing on the show, and I'm going to resume doing this week, I decided to spotlight almost every week one of those theaters around the country. And this week, I'm talking about the Ragtag Cinema, which is a two-screen theater located in Columbia, Missouri. Ragtag Cinema springs from a group that was founded in 1998. They opened their first theater in the year 2000 and became a nonprofit in 2004. Back in 2008, after over $250,000 in community support, they moved to their current home, which is located in an old Coca-Cola bottling plant where the theater projects films on both digital and 35 millimeter. Ragtag Cinema shares space with a record store, a bakery, and an art gallery, so you can pretty much take care of everything right then and there. This week, if you were to visit the theater, you could catch everything everywhere all at once, still on the big screen, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which we just talked about, and Return to Soul, which has been featured on this show a few times. And tonight, Tuesday night, if you happen to be near Columbia, Missouri, they'll be screening the film Tank Girl, on 35 millimeter as part of a continuing screening series. And they host a lot of these screening series over the course of the year, as well as film festivals and other things like that. If you want to find out more about the Ragtag Cinema, or if you want to donate, because keep in mind they are a nonprofit, you can go to ragtagcinema.org. And if you make a donation to the Ragtag Cinema, or you happen to stop by in Columbia, Missouri, as always, tell them Dan sent you. Of course, the theaters that feature a lot of these independent films or limited release films aren't the big chain theaters. They're the smaller independent theaters, and I've been featuring one semi-weekly here on the show. And the theater I'm featuring this week is Film Scene in Iowa City, Iowa. After the last theater closed in downtown Iowa City, Film Scene was founded in 2011 to revitalize the, well, film scene downtown. What began as a series of screenings evolved into a community-supported theater that opened in 2013. Film Scene has since expanded to a second location. In addition to a series of all-ages outdoor screenings that they hold during the summer, all kinds of movies, independent films, family films, you can find it all. This weekend, you can see Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. You can see Polite Society. You can see Showing Up, all great indie films and films that may fall just outside of the mainstream in a lot of other theaters, as well as some late night screenings. For example, Saturday night, they're showing Martin Scorsese's After Hours on 35mm. There are also several special events and screenings coming up, including showings of Minari and Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And their mission there is so great. It's all about the love of film. That's really what unites all of these theaters. They're run by people that are passionate about movies and want to spread the love of film and cinema as widely as they can. As all of the theaters we featured so far have been, Film Scene is a 501c3 non profit organization, which means that any donation that you make is tax deductible. And you can find more info, including scheduling, how to buy tickets and how to donate at icfilmscene.org. That's the letters IC and then filmscene.org. And if you decide to go to Film Scene or make a donation, as always, tell them Dan sent you. I'd like to take a moment to feature an independent theater as we have been doing on the show for the past several weeks. And this week we are talking about The Loft Cinema in Tucson, Arizona, which has existed in its current form as an indie-focused art house since 1972. So it just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Back in 2002, a group of cinema lovers in Tucson bought the theater to preserve its history and its mission and turned it into a nonprofit. Since then, the theater is known not just for showing indie films, but also for special events, including Screamorama horror movie sleepovers, as well as classic film spotlight series. Currently, The Loft is running a cult classic series featuring films like Princess Mononoke, Ready or Not, and Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. There are also special events coming up, like a May the 4th screening of The Empire Strikes Back, and uh, this is my favorite, a Mother's Day screening of Aliens. What a perfect movie to screen on Mother's Day. If you go to the theater this week, you can also catch up on indies like Showing Up, Polite Society, Bo is Afraid, and Everything Everywhere All at Once. This really sounds like a cool place. They've been operating for decades now. They used to operate out of an actual loft above, I think, a bike shop. You can check out the Loft Cinema at loftcinema.org, which is where you can become a member, or you can donate at loftcinema.org because they're a 501c3 organization, which is what I'll be doing because, as a reminder, this week and every week that we feature an indie movie theater, 10% of the ad revenue 
revenue from YouTube will go to those theaters as a donation. I've already donated to several theaters and it just feels great to be able to support these organizations. And by watching this video and the ads and everything else, you're also supporting these independent theaters. So the Loft Cinema in Tucson, Arizona, this week's Indie Theater Spotlight. And if you go there, if you catch a movie or if you donate, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And also each week, the theater that I talk about gets 10% of the ad revenue from this specific episode where we talk about them. So by watching this show, you're actually supporting a lot of these independent theaters. And this week I'm talking about the Kentucky Theater in Lexington, Kentucky, one of the last original movie palaces. It's been open for over a century, dating back to 1922, save for a brief closure in the late 80s, early 90s due to a fire. After being hit hard by pandemic closures. The theater was very recently converted and taken over by a nonprofit 501c3 organization, which means it can use your donations even more than some of the ones that we've been talking about because it is a brand new nonprofit entity, just over a year that it's been running as one. Not only does the Kentucky Theater show some of the best available movies in independent cinema at any given time, they also do special events like their summer classic movie series, which are featuring some of my favorite films of all time this summer and also their monthly Freaky Friday event which showcases cult cinema oh what I wouldn't give to see police story on the big screen with a packed theater the Kentucky Theater as I mentioned is a 501c3 nonprofit organization so you can make a tax deductible donation or if you're in Lexington Kentucky or visiting you can maybe go check out a movie there regardless of what you decide to do you can find out more information about the Kentucky Theater at kentuckytheater.org including how and where to make donations. And if you do decide to visit or make a donation, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week we're looking at what looks like a beautiful old theater called the North Park Theater in Buffalo, New York. Originally opened in November of 1920, it boasted early 20th century architecture and Art Nouveau murals throughout, as well as a large stained glass window in the front of the building. Over the years, the theater's original beauty was lost as subsequent owners modernized to cut cost. But in 2013, with the theater badly in need of modernization, not just in design, but also in digital projection, the theater was purchased by local business owners and restored, including hiring the original company who designed the marquee in the 1940s to restore it, as well as local artists to bring back the building's murals. The original stained glass windows were uncovered shortly thereafter, and the North Park Theater now operates as a 501c3 nonprofit, Buffalo's only nonprofit cinema. Right now, you can catch Book Club the next chapter there, and the North Park also often runs revivals and special screenings, and plus, it's just a beautiful theater. You can find out more and donate at northparktheater.org. And of course, as always, 10% of the ad revenue for this episode will go to the theater, as we have been doing for the previous theaters we highlighted. Good news, because of your support, I've been able to donate over $200 to the various theaters that we've featured uh, throughout the different weeks here on the show. So uh, the more you watch, the more you share. Um, obviously, that's great for the channel, but it also benefits here on Charts with Dan, these independent theaters that we talk about here on the show. So North Park Theater in Buffalo, if you want to see a beautiful old restored 1920s theater, give them a visit or shoot them a donation. And if you do either, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. Of course, these limited release films are often supported by independent theaters, not just here in the U.S., but also around the world. And we've started a feature here on the show where we spotlight one every week and then 10% of our ad revenue for this week's episode, we'll go to that theater. And this week we are spotlighting the Drexel Theater in Columbus, Ohio, which was converted from a grocery store into an art deco theater back in 1937. That single screen theater was then converted to a three screen theater and is committed to showing independent films not found at nearby larger theaters in Columbus. In 2011, the theater was turned into a nonprofit by the new owners, a group called Friends of the Drexel. And the Drexel is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places and constantly in the process of both restoration and renovation. The Drexel is currently playing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, and Paul Schrader's Master Gardener. The Little Mermaid's going to open there this weekend along with other independent films. They also have a Monday screening series that has a different theme 
screen each month. Next week, they are wrapping up David Lynch. And then in June, they're starting a screening series dedicated to seduction cinema. If you want to find Showtimes, buy tickets, find out more about the theater, or donate because the Drexel is a nonprofit theater, you can head over to drexel.net. And if you do end up heading over there or donating, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week, we are going all the way to the Pacific Northwest to the Blue Mouse Theater in Tacoma, Washington. It was opened in November of 1923, which means it is almost 100 years old and has remained in continuous operation ever since. The Blue Mouse was originally part of a larger chain of theaters in the Pacific Northwest, including a larger Blue Mouse Theater in Tacoma. It was since renamed the Proctor and then the Bijou over the years, and the theater was bought in the 1990s by a group of locals who feared that it would be targeted for closure as it struggled for survival. The theater was restored back to its original state, inside and out, and offers a variety of options for cinephiles in the Tacoma area. In addition to playing new releases like Across the Spider-Verse. The Blue Mouse also hosts local movie screenings, a once-monthly horror movie revival night, special revival screenings like an upcoming Costumes and Courage showing of Ghostbusters that's happening next week, and a regular screening of the Rocky Horror Picture Show featuring their own dedicated Rocky Horror troupe, the Blue Mouseketeers. In 2010, the Blue Mouse was listed on the National Registry of Historic Places, and you can find out more at bluemousetheater.com. There was not a donation link that I could find there, but if you do end up going there to see a movie, as always, be sure to tell them Dan sent you. And this is one where, I mean, they're all special, but the story that I found behind this theater is one that is very special, and I'll be very happy to provide the donation generated by you watching this video to this theater. The theater is called the Prospector Theater in Ridgefield, Connecticut. It was founded by Val Jensen, who was inspired by her sister, who was born with Down syndrome. Val Jensen wanted to start a business that provided meaningful work opportunities to those with disabilities. In 2014, she spearheaded the opening of the Prospector Theater, which was completely renovated from its original building, the Ridgefield Playhouse, which was the city's first movie theater. It was set for demolition. It was renovated into a state-of-the-art movie theater, and 75% of the employees at the Prospector self-identify as people with disabilities. The theater also works to make itself a haven for those who need special accommodations. In addition to providing equipment like captioning devices and audio description headphones, the Prospector also holds open caption screenings and sensory friendly screenings so that those who struggle with the traditional theatrical experience can also enjoy the movies. The Prospector is currently playing Across the Spider-Verse, The Little Mermaid, and Guardians 3, but it also holds special screenings such as a June 15th screening of my favorite movie of all time, Jaws as well as local events like their upcoming superhero short film festival. The theater also produces its own pre-show entertainment and social media content, which provides even more opportunities for their employees. What a great story. I mean, every week I have a, a running list because people have recommended you, the viewer, have recommended so many theaters to me, and I'll just kind of go through and try to find one that I wanted to feature. And when I looked at this one, I said, well, I cannot wait to tell people about this because first of all, it just looks like a fantastic theater and a great place for movie fans and secondly to have a mission like this and to see the pictures on social media and the fact that this is obviously such a meaningful place for so many this is why I love doing this spotlight is to show people that there are places around like this that are motivated not just by a love for movies but by a love for people and, and this is one of those places. You can find more info about the Prospector Theater at prospectortheater.org. They are a 501c3 nonprofit, so you can also make a donation there. And if you do end up going to Ridgefield, Connecticut to see a movie, make sure to tell them, as always, that Dan sent you. And I hope that I also get a chance to visit this theater sometime in the future. Of course, these limited release specialty films are often found in the independent theaters that are scattered around the country, and I'm going to be taking a moment, as I've done for the past several weeks, to spotlight one here on the show. And this week, we are talking about the Gibson Theater, which is located in Batesville, Indiana, literally a Main Street theater built originally in 1921. It played silent films until 1929, when it was upgraded for talking pictures, and it has stayed on Main Street for over 100 years 
years serving the town of Batesville, current population just over 7,000. The Gibson features neon lights and is one of the most historic of historic theaters. And right now they actually need a little bit of help because they've been trying to raise funds to buy new seats for the theater. The ones that they have are very loved after decades of use and need to be replaced. So they've had an ongoing fundraiser for quite some time and they are a 501c3 organization, meaning that all donations to them are tax deductible. Of course, for the Gibson, as with every theater that we feature here on the show, 10% of the ad revenue for this video will be donated and hopefully maybe will help them buy these new seats. The Gibson Place hosts two first-run movies, local shows, and even free films for kids on Wednesday mornings during the summer. If you want to find out more about the Gibson Theater, including how to donate, you can go to thegibsontheater.com. And if you do decide to drop a donation or drop in to see a movie, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week we are looking at the Gene Siskel Film Center in Chicago, Illinois. I am a Roger Ebert guy, but Gene Siskel was the other half of that duo, and I watch Siskel and Ebert every single week, so I am happy to highlight this particular theater. It was founded in 1972 as the Film Center of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, but renamed the Gene Siskel Film Center in 2000, shortly after the death of Gene Siskel, who was not only a legendary film critic, but a legendary figure around Chicago. And the Gene Siskel Film Center is devoted to the promotion and preservation of classic and independent cinema, and also has a commitment to diverse and inclusive programming. This week alone, you can find screenings of the independent film Blue Gene as their first run feature, along with revivals of After Sun, The Lion King, Fences, The Mosquito Coast, Paper Moon, and Bicycle Thieves as part of their Daddy Issues film series exploring fatherhood on film. You can also catch 12 Angry Men there as part of their Science on Screen series and that's just this week when possible the Cisco Film Center presents films on 35 millimeter and also hosts numerous festivals and film celebrations throughout the year you can find out more at siskelfilmcenter.org. They are also a 501c3 organization, which means that any donation you make is tax deductible and you can donate on their website. If you go there and decide to catch one of those great movies or make a donation, please, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. Not only do they get the spotlight here, but 10% of the ad revenue from the episode that these theaters are featured on will go then to that theater. And the theater that we're talking about today is the Plaza Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, which was opened in 1939. It played some of Hollywood's most classic films before becoming an adult theater in the 1970s. Then in the 1980s, it was bought and renovated to become a two-screen theater. Back in 2006, the theater was bought and became a nonprofit organization, and it now holds the title of the oldest continually operating movie theater in Atlanta and also lays claim to being the only independent theater in the city as well. The current manager, Christopher Escobar, took over several years ago. The theater survived the pandemic and the plaza now shows films in both 35 and 70 millimeter and there are plans to continue to improve the theater facilities and expand programming. This week at the plaza, you can catch first run movies like Asteroid City and The Blackening, as well as Friday shows of 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70 millimeter and a live Rocky Horror Picture Show event. You can find out more at plazaatlanta.com to see what their schedule is and to pick up tickets. And of course, if you do end up showing up, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week we are talking about the Neon Theater in Dayton, Ohio, which opened in the late 1980s as the Dayton Cinema, but it's been under current management as the Neon since 2001. The Neon shows first run and independent movies as well as participating in local film festivals and staging special events. And it's just a cool looking theater. I love the design and everything. Like I would love to go and make this my local theater if I lived in Dayton, Ohio, but I don't. If you go to the Neon this week, you'll be able to see Asteroid City and Past Lives, as well as a one-night-only screening of the documentary Vermeer, The Greatest Exhibition, and a presentation of the National Theater Live. I was watching an interview with the manager of the Neon. It was from a while ago, but he was talking about what they want to do with the theater, and he said something that kind of struck me. He said, we want to bring good films to town. And that seems to be the mission for so many of these independent theaters that we've been talking about here on the show, and I think it's also why they are worthy of a spotlight, and they're worthy of your support. So if you want to find out more about the Neon, including showtimes and how to buy tickets, you can check out their website at neonmovies.com, and if you end up going as always be sure to tell them that dan sent you 
This week, we're going to be talking about the Varsity Theater in Davis, California. Davis is a town of over 65,000 people, about 20 minutes outside of Sacramento, California, and of course, home to UC Davis. And the Varsity Theater was originally opened back in 1921, but the current location opened in 1950. The Varsity operated as both a single screen and a two screen theater until 1992 when the city of Davis took ownership of the theater and converted it into a live performance venue. However, in 2006, the city decided to reopen the Varsity as an art house theater and it has been running two screens once again since 2010. This week, the Varsity is playing Asteroid City and Past Lives with Barbie and Oppenheimer on the slate next week. And with its throwback Art Deco-esque style, it is the kind of local history and culture that I think must be preserved in these times of instability. You can find out more about the Varsity Theater and check showtimes at davisvarsity.net. And if you do decide to see a show, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week we are talking about a very special theater because it's not just a theater, it's also operated by a really good organization. The theater is called the Alamo Theater in Bucksport, Maine, a town of around 5,000. Built in 1916, the Alamo was originally meant for both film and live theatrical performances, and it operated as a movie theater until 1956 before several other businesses occupied the space. Back in 1992, a then-fledgling organization called North East Historic Film, which is devoted to the preservation of film, media, and history in the northeastern United States, bought the vacant space and with the help of the town of Bucksport, slowly began the process of renovating the Alamo Theater. The new Alamo Theater started projecting film in 35mm in May of 1999, and the space currently shows a mixture of films along with hosting community events. This week, the theater is hosting a screening of Up Country from a local Maine filmmaker, as well as Asteroid City this weekend. And then on Saturday afternoon, I think this is so cool, the town of Bucksport is sponsoring a free screening of the Super Mario Brothers movie to anybody in the public who wants to show up. Now, in addition to operating the Alamo, Northeast Historic Film also offers digitization and transfer services for VHS, 16mm, and 8mm film, and they also offer vault storage in order for people to preserve film, and this is all in support of their cause, which is to catalog and preserve the history of Northern New England through moving images. You can find out more about the work of Northeast Historic Film, as well as buy tickets for the Alamo, and make a charitable donation at oldfilm.org, and if you do any of those things, as always, please be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. Now these movies that we talk about in limited or specialty release are often found at the various independent theaters around the country, but that's not the case with this week's theater. You actually will rarely find new release movies, even ones like Barbie and Oppenheimer playing at this theater. Instead, you will find some of the most classic films to ever grace the silver screen. And this is a theater that many people might be familiar with. It is the Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas, which is actually two theaters now located next to each other, the Paramount and the Stateside Theater. The original Paramount Theater was built in 1915 as a vaudeville theater. And in that era, acts including Harry Houdini and the Marx Brothers graced the stage. The theater was converted to show films in the 1930s and played host to some of the all-time classics of cinema, as well as in-person appearances from stars like Katherine Hepburn, as cinema attendance declined in the 60s and 70s, the Paramount seemed headed for destruction, but was saved in 1973 by three local businessmen who, along with the community, helped to fund the renovation of the theater, established it as a nonprofit, and restored the theater's ability to serve as a live act venue in addition to screening films. It merged with the Next Door State Theater in the 1990s and has become a local hub of culture and activity as Austin Star has risen in the film community. The Paramount is not generally, as I mentioned, a first-run theater, but instead is focused on film history and appreciation in addition to live musical acts. This week alone, the Paramount will host screenings of Sally Potter's 1992 film Orlando, Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Disney's Sleeping Beauty, and a horror double feature of classic Vincent Price films, House of Wax, and Theater of Blood. This week will also see the culmination of one of the Paramount's two-week summer theater programs, which features performances from the campers, 
And in addition to running all of these classic film series, the Paramount also teams with partner organizations to provide free tickets to use in programs related to the arts. It's great to see organizations like this and especially movie theaters that support kids going into the arts and they want to educate kids about the festivals and give them resources and a place to do things. These spaces need to exist and the Paramount seems like a great space. You can find out about the schedule for the Paramount Theater, buy tickets and donate as well. It is a 501 one c3 organization at austintheater.org and if you end up doing any of those things as always be sure to tell them that dan sent you and for the first time we're going to leave the confines of the united states we're going to hop across the pond and we're going to go to a theater that was actually brought to my attention by andy merriweather he is the musical genius and co-host behind a show that i've done several times called settle the score hosted by matt nost it's a really fun show if you haven't seen it here on youtube i highly recommend it but he sent me the name of a local theater that he thought it would be great for me to spotlight and that theater is called the parade cinema in marlboro wiltshire County, England. It's about 120 kilometers west of London on the road to Bath. Marlboro has a population of around 9,000 and the parade seats about 100 in a former chapel that was built in 1817. That's right. When you feature independent movie theaters that are in the UK, they're in buildings that are almost as old as this country. In the wake of the pandemic, the parade cinema opened for business in September of 2021 and in December of 2021 received an official opening with a royal visit from now Queen Camilla. The parade currently is playing Oppenheimer and the Super Mario Brothers movie and starting on Friday, you will be able to catch Barbenheimer because it will be playing both Barbie and Oppenheimer. Elemental will also be coming to the theater later this month. The parade is also home to the Parade Cafe where patrons can gather for food and drinks starting at 9.30 every morning. And it has a membership program and sells tickets online. If you want to find out more about the Parade Cinema, go to theparadecinema.com. And if you head out to Marlboro and see a movie, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. And this week I'm featuring a theater in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. It's called the Sun Cinema. It's just two miles down 16th Street Northwest from the White House. In 2015, co-founders Dave Cabrera and Ryan Mitchell raised $16,000 on Kickstarter to help get this theater off the ground. It was opened in 2016. It's a small 40-seat theater featuring improvised seats, just whatever seats they could find, and curated selections that veer far away from mainstream first-run on showings and even a lot of independent theaters that show older titles. This month, for example, the theater is featuring films from Bolivian filmmaker Jorge Sanjinas and Hungarian director Miklos Jankso. In addition to the screening room, the Sun Cinema also has a bar to hang out and dissect what you just saw. And when you look at all of the theaters that I've spotlighted so far here on the show, this one to me, and I haven't been there, but just from what I've gathered and what I've seen, the pictures, etc., seems to have the most indie sensibility in the sense of like, it is very no frills. Like I said, the seats look like, you know, like some of them are like ballpark seats. Some of them are just regular old chairs. Some of them are like wing back chairs. It's whatever they could find. It's a very, very small venue. And it really looks to be programmed for the love of movies. Literally to say like, hey, let's try this. Let's throw this movie out there. Well, this might be a terrible movie, but let's see how people react to it. It really is the sort of thing of like, we're operating this thing at a scale where we can show whatever the hell we want. And we're just going to see if people show up and if they like it. And if two people show up and dig it, then we've done our job. That is indie cinema at its heart. And this really does seem to be a theater that operates for the love of cinema. If you want to find out more about Sun Cinema, you can find their latest schedule at sunscinema.com. They also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash sunscinema. And if you end up heading there or supporting them in any way, of course, as always, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. Now, a lot of these specialty release films that we were just talking about can be found at the independent movie theaters that are spread around this country and around the world that are devoted to spreading a love, not just for studio movies, but for these independent films. And I've been featuring a different theater on the show for the past few months. 10% of the ad revenue from this show will go to the theaters that accept donations. And this week we're talking about the Sidewalk Cinema in Birmingham, Alabama, which is also the home of the Sidewalk Film Center. 
The Sidewalk Cinema's current location has been open since 2019 and features an intimate two-screen theater, which is programmed with popular library titles, as well as indie films. And the theater has a real community focus because the Sidewalk Cinema also has a large lobby and bar area that serves as a venue for community events like movie trivia nights. Hey, it sounds like my kind of deal. Also this week, it's a big week for the Sidewalk Film Center. They're hosting Birmingham's annual Sidewalk Film Festival, a week-long celebration of film featuring current indie hits and a selection of films from local talent. The festival has been a Birmingham staple since 1989 and has really gotten some buzz around the country. Sidewalk's mission is to encourage and facilitate filmmakers in Alabama and also grow the audience locally for independent film. I can tell you from experience that these organizations may be easy to find in L.A. or New York or even a big production hub like Austin, but they are few and far between, especially here in the South and places like Alabama and Arkansas. And so I really do appreciate what the Sidewalk Film Center is doing and what the Sidewalk Cinema is doing in Birmingham. It's a 501c3 organization, so any donation you make is tax deductible. If you want to find out more about the festival, the Sidewalk Film Center, or the Sidewalk Cinema, you can go to sidewalkfest.com. And as always, if you decide to donate or head over there to see a movie, tell them that Dan sent you. So this week we are going to the north, to the north of the United States, and in fact north of the United States, to Canada, to feature the Rio Theater in Vancouver, British Columbia. The Rio offers both live entertainment and movie screenings. It was built back in 1938 and seats over 400 patrons. It has been many things over the years, including a bowling alley and during COVID, a sports bar, because due to COVID regulations in Canada that allowed bars and restaurants to be open, but not movie theaters, the Rio transformed itself into a sports bar playing only sporting events to stay afloat. The theater almost fell prey to rezoning in 2017 in order to build new condominiums, but an outpouring of support and funds from the community allowed it to remain what it is now back to post-COVID, which is an indie single screen theater. You can snack on traditional theater fare as well as grilled cheese sandwiches and a full bar. Coming up in November is the annual Rio Grind Film Festival, a four-day exhibition of the best modern over Overlooked grindhouse style films. This week, you can catch Tank Girl with a live QA with director Rachel Talale. You can catch The Faculty. You can catch a burlesque cancer fundraiser, Past Lives, The Breakfast Club. There's really a little bit of everything going on at the Rio. For ticket sales and more, you can check out riotheater.ca. And if you end up going, be sure to tell them, as always, that Dan sent you. Now, many of those movies and other independent films can be found in the independent theaters that are scattered around the country. And I wanted to highlight not just one theater, but two theaters this week. They're run by the same organization. I'm talking about the State Theater and the Bijou by the Bay Theater, both of them in Traverse City, Michigan, and operated by the Traverse City Film Festival organization. The State Theater dates back to 1916 when it was built as The Lyric. After burning down a couple of times and being renamed The State in 1949, the theater closed in 1996 but was protected from destruction while plans were made for its future. In 2007, the theater was donated to the Traverse City Film Festival and after extensive renovation, opened in November 2007 as a single screen theater and a very majestic looking one, I have to say. The Bijou by the Bay is a smaller theater just a block away from the state that was also transformed from an abandoned museum into a theater in 2013. The state is playing My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 this week, while Barbie is still gracing the Bijou's single screen. Coming up next month, the State Theater will be sponsoring a special screening of the documentary After Parkland, which focuses on the families of those lost in 2018's Parkland school shooting. Both theaters are operated by the Travis. City Film Festival, which recently decided to stop holding its annual event. Their focus is now on running these two theaters, and the organization is a 501c3 nonprofit, which means that you can deduct any donations that you make. You can donate and buy tickets for both theaters at stateandbijou.org. And if you end up going or donating, be sure to tell them, as always, that Dan sent you. And many of these smaller and independent films, the ones that are not in wide release, the ones that are perhaps off of many people's radars are at the small independent theaters that are scattered around the country and indeed the world, which is why we are actually going to hop back across.
across the pond for this week's Indie Theater Spotlight to talk about the Cultplex in Manchester, UK. It began in 2019 as the Chapel Town Picture House, and Cultplex is dedicated to screening cult and genre films, as well as hosting gaming events, pub quizzes, and generally just being a gathering spot for film buffs in the Manchester area and beyond. Cultplex is currently located inside of Grub, which is a local Manchester street food venue. It seats about 100 film fans. When you look at the theater, it really does seem like one of those things where we got a spare room wherever we could. We put in some seats. We just want a place to show as many movies as we can and get people to gather together. That's what I love about independent theaters. The big ones, the little ones, they are driven by a love of film, and that really seems to be Cultplex's mission. This week, you can catch screenings of The Witch, The Muppet Movie, and Lady Bird, which is part of their ongoing film series called Movie Church, and October brings the cinema's stab film season, which kicks off on October 1st with a marathon of the first four Scream movies and scary movies to be held throughout the rest of the month. You can find out more about Cultplex at cultplex.co.uk, and if you check them out or end up seeing a movie there, as always, tell them that Dan sent you. And this week, we are looking at the Cape Cinema in Dennis, Massachusetts, which has been serving Cape Cod since 1930. The building has always been a movie house, but it looks like a church because it was modeled after a church when it was initially built. It also has a beautiful interior featuring floor-to-ceiling murals from painter Rockwell Kent. I want to see these in person someday. In 1939, the Cape Cinema was chosen as a test market for a little movie called The Wizard of Oz and was one of the first theaters in the country to show the film, an occasion that it marks every year on August 11th. As of this year, the Cape Cinema is also a 501c3 nonprofit and runs largely independent films. This week, you can catch the film My Sailor, My Love. And next week, the Cape will play John Carney's new film, Flora and Son. They also host special events like Throwback Thursday and Splatter Day, featuring classic horror films. The next Splatter Day feature will be Eaten Alive from director Toby Hooper. You can also catch the Met Opera Live at the Cape Cinema if you're a person of culture. You can find the schedule as well as how to donate at capecinema.org. And as a reminder, 10% of the ad revenue from every episode of Charts with Dan that features a nonprofit cinema will go to that cinema. So 10% of today's ad rev will be going to Cape Cinema. If you end up going there to see a movie or you end up making a donation, as always, tell them Dan sent you. 10% of the advertising revenue from this episode will go to the theater that is featured on the show if they are a 501c3, as the theater we're featuring this week is. And this week we're talking about the State Theater in Modesto, California, which opened on Christmas Day 1934 and has been in operation ever since, outlasting many of its contemporaries. The state was restored and became a nonprofit in 2005, and the Art Deco design of the 550-seat theater has largely been preserved. The state also opened a small screening room next door called The Jewel, which is a 25-seater, to expand the offerings that they can make available. The state is a mixed-use venue, hosting mostly movie screenings, but also live concerts and events mixed in. This week, you can catch The Blind, Past Lives, and The Original Old Boy, along with special Halloween screenings of Casper, Hocus Pocus, and Aliens on Saturday, with many more Halloween classics to come throughout the month. The state also runs a summer filmmaking class and screenwriting classes for future filmmakers, educational programs, and even screenings where you can bring your dog. The next Bring Your Dog screening is the movie Balto on October 22nd. You can find out more about the state schedule and how to donate at thestate.org. And if you do decide to go see a movie or make a donation, as always, tell them Dan sent you. Many of these films that I talked about in limited release are playing in the numerous independent theaters that are scattered around the country that play indie films, blockbusters that are not part of a major chain and that often rely on memberships and patronage and donations to stay running. I think they are part of the lifeblood of cinema here and around the world. And so I like to feature one theater here on the show most weeks. And if these theaters take donations, then 10% of the ad revenue from this particular episode or the episode in which the theater is featured will be 
be donated to that theater. And this week, I am talking about the Texas Theater in Dallas, Texas, which opened in 1931 to provide state-of-the-art movies to the Dallas area and was most famous for being the first theater in the city to have air conditioning until 1963, when a man named Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested there shortly after shooting John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States, on November 22nd. The theater was remodeled after that, but was restored back to its original condition by Oliver Stone for his film JFK. However, a series of incidents, including bankruptcy and a fire, caused the theater to close several times in the 1990s and become run down. But it was rescued by the Oak Cliff Foundation in the early 2000s, and in 2010, the Texas theater reopened for regular operations while recently undergoing a multi-million dollar renovation to seat 670 patrons downstairs and another 165 in its upstairs theater. This week, you can catch Pedro Almodovar's short film, Strange Way of Life, along with his 2020 short film, The Human Voice, as well as the Talking Heads concert film, Stop Making Sense. And on Saturday, Halloween classics Psycho and Bride of Chucky will also be screening. Later this month, you can also see Killers of the Flower Moon, Scream, Nosferatu, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and many more. To check out more about the Texas theater, including its rich and detailed history and showtimes, you can go to Texas theater.com and if you end up catching a movie there be sure to tell them as always that Dan sent you and this week I actually get to speak from experience because this is a theater that I visited just last week I took a drive a few hours out of town to Tulsa Oklahoma in order to see a screening of Killers of the Flower Moon I'll have my review for that later this week here on the channel and that screening was held at a really nice indie theater called the Circle Cinema in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is the only nonprofit movie theater operating in Tulsa and the oldest movie theater in the city with a mission to offer a diverse array of programming aimed at celebrating and fostering a sense of community. The Circle Cinema opened in July of 1928. It went through a refurbishment in the 60s. There was a stint as an adult theater in the 70s, and then the theater was closed in the mid-1990s. But in December 2002, the Circle Cinema was reborn as a non Nonprofit organization and reopened in 2004. A refurbishment that concluded back in 2014 included the reinstallation of the theater's original pipe organ, and the building is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Circle hosts film screenings, community events, festivals, special presentations of silent films and classic movies, filmmaker appearances, and more. You can also see The Circle in the opening minutes of 1983's The Outsiders. Right now, you can catch The Royal Hotel, Dumb Money, Stop Making Sense, A Haunting in Venice, Pedro Almodovar's Strange Way of Life, and the documentary Bad Press. This weekend, you can also catch Killers of the Flower Moon and The Heiress Tour, as well as Dick's the Musical, a lot of movies that we've talked about here on this show. I really just dug the atmosphere of the Circle Cinema. They also have a gallery, and they were setting up for a community event while I was there. It really did feel like a small town theater that actually did care about keeping the world of cinema alive. The staff that I spoke to there was very friendly and it was just a very nice theater i enjoyed my time there you can find out more including show times how to buy tickets and how to donate because they are a 501c3 organization at circlecinema.org and just as a reminder 10 percent of the ad revenue from this video will go to circle cinema anytime i feature a theater on this show then 10 percent of the ad rev goes to that theater if they take donations and if you do end up going to the circle cinema tell them as always that dan sent you and this week we're talking about the Enzian, a theater in Maitland, Florida, near Orlando. It was founded in 1985 and claims the title of Central Florida's only full-time independent theater. Enzian began as a place to show classic movies, but in the late 80s, the theater transitioned to showing first-run independent films. And of all the theaters I've seen and covered on the show, this is one of the most unique looking. It's set amid some luscious greenery outside. It has some large chairs, love seats, sofas, and tables inside so you can enjoy your movie in sort of a casual dining atmosphere. The theater operates under the slogan Film Food Friends and also offers the Eden Bar attached to the building so you can make a full night out of seeing a movie. This week, you can see A24's Dicks the Musical, which we just talked about, as well as 1993's Body Snatchers in celebration of the Halloween season. They will also be presenting their once-monthly popcorn flicks in the park in nearby Winter Park, Florida, which is a free movie screening open 
development to the community. This month's movie is Vincent Price's classic House on Haunted Hill. Upcoming features at NZN include Alexander Payne's The Holdovers, as well as hosting the Central Florida Jewish Film Festival and a cult classic screening of 1990s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. NZN is also a nonprofit that accepts donations, and you can find out more at nzn.org if you end up making a donation or heading over there to see a movie. Please tell them, as always, that Dan sent you. Let's finish out this first round of spotlights with the Princeton Garden Theater, which is located literally across the street from Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. The Princeton Garden opened in 1920 and has changed owners across the decades. It was renovated in 2001 and again in 2014 for modernization and to reorganize the seating. And it is currently open as a nonprofit theater with a mission to promote and show independent films and to promote movies as an art form. This week at the Princeton Garden Theater, you can catch Killers of the Flower Moon and Anatomy of a Fall, in addition to other special programming like family and classic films. On the 16th of this month, they'll actually be showing one of my favorite underrated movies of all time, Ace in the Hole, starring Kirk Douglas. And coming soon, you can catch Dream Scenario, The Holdovers, Maestro, and many other films at the Princeton Garden. You can find out more, including how to buy tickets and donate at PrincetonGardenTheater.org. And as always, if you do donate or you make your way over there to see a movie, be sure to tell them that Dan sent you. Thanks again for watching, and be sure to stay tuned right here for more movie news reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.